Now, let's see, today is what Wednesday, right? So tomorrow I'll be in a workshop all day, so there won't be any classes tomorrow, but there we have a workshop for the faculty from 8.30 to 5 o'clock, so, so I, but there. Next Monday and Tuesday, I'm planning on just meeting in our normal classroom times, that they're in the normal classroom. And the reason is, is next next week on Monday and Tuesday, I'm really pl not planning any lectures. That's your time to finish that midterm project that there. You know, it's due next Thursday, so I'll be in the lab. I'll just go in there, set up, do my own thing, let you work on the project. If you have questions, I'll answer them. What I'll probably do is I'll probably set up the projector and my laptop to record any questions that come up that they're simply because if someone has a question over the midterm, what I've discovered over the years is that you know and I won't record coming to sitting down at your workstation and fixing your syntax errors for you. You know that that there you know that there, but I'm saying if someone's got a question over the logic or something like that, if one person's asking the question, there's probably at least a half dozen other people that have got the same question and have got around to answer asking. Now, you see, it's the gentlemen that meet on Monday, so the ladies will have a little bit of an advantage that they can look at any questions that come up on Monday and <laughs> review those before they come in on Tuesday. That there, but they'll probably be a the, you know, the lecture from Monday and Tuesday, and I'll report both Monday and Tuesday, will be just when I turn on the computer to answer a question right, that there. So I won't record any lecture for Monday and Tuesday. Next Thursday, I'd like to meet as a group. Wednesday, we don't have class. That's at there. So I just like, you know, we'll meet up here, and we'll probably kind of wrap up the C topic that there, and then get ready to go into MATLAB right there. So that there. So, okay, let me just kind of jump ahead. As I said, there's 214 slides in this chapter. I'm not going to go through all 214. I looked at it. A lot of it I'm going to skip, but uh, right there. Okay, the last thing I talked about was talking was talking about the function prototype that there calls, that there, and we mentioned the correct number and types of arguments. You know, the, the one that they've been using has been the function where it's called uh, maximum, where we pass it three integers that returns back the largest of the three in in integers that they're... <coughs> we can go through and write another function, for example, where we pass in an array. We'll talk about arrays probably next week. Actually, yeah, next Thursday I'll probably introduce arrays that they're... I won't get into files in this semester right there. So I'll probably stop at, at arrays right there. I'll talk about one and two dimensional arrays right there. You'll see arrays again in great detail in MATLAB. So that's why I can kind of skip over arrays a little bit in, in the C is because MATLAB, by the way, the term MATLAB stands for matrix lab, laboratory. So Matrices is another term for an array. Actually, a matrix is a two by two array, but you can have three dimensional arrays in one in two two dimensional arrays right there. So when we look at MATLAB, we'll, we'll be looking at arrays in more detail right there. So there. So again, declare a function of the same type double double. We have to, and I talked about the fact that we have to use. We can't do it like we declare. In other words, at the beginning of our program, we can say double x and y and that's declares two variables x and y and they're both a tight double that's we, that's perfectly legit but in a program or in a function declaration we would have a function called double right there and we're going to call the function x y z and we're going to pass it double right there that's supposed to be double right there x comma double Y right there. You have to declare them separately. Is, is all, all that this is saying right there. Okay, you get errors if again this is repeating the the last part of yesterday's discussion. If the function prototype, header, and calls do not all agree. In other words, if I declare if I write a function to find the maximum of three numbers and I pass it four numbers, 
I should get an error when, when I compile because they don't agree with each other right, out there. So there, you sometimes you will get errors in the linker, and those are the most puzzling errors. And the reason those are very puzzling errors is because they're often very cryptic. They don't tell you what they mean, and they're for calls, usually something in the library that it matches the header, but it doesn't match the code, and you don't have access to the code. So whenever you get one of these linker errors, it's you're, you're doing one of two things. The most common linker error is you forget to include the prototype right there, you know, right there. But the most, but there, if you get a linker error out there, it's usually you're you're using a function wrong out there, and you almost have to go back to the compiler manual or the reference book or whatever and look at what do you pass to cosine or tangent? What do you pass to complex multiply? What do you pass to these functions that are, are there in the library out there? We won't get into linker errors, not in the next week or two, and hopefully you don't get any linker errors on the one project you're turning in for C. Right now. So, okay, uh, again, we talked about this yesterday. If we're passing at 20 variables, chances are we're asking it to do too much right there. We, again, we want to keep in mind that one function equals one task right there. A function should do one thing and one thing only. If you're asking a function to do three things, it's too complicated. Now, you can have, call a function to do, that calls three other functions out there, but typically it should be one function, one task, and we should keep the header line to one line if possible. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but typically, and that's why they say, if possible, right there. So, you just keep in mind that anything that you're going to write as an engineer, you know, I'm not going to say as a student, but even as a student, anything you're going to write as an engineer out in industry, if you're not a programmer for, for a particular company, that there. Chances are you're going to write very little C code to be. <laughs> I'll be quite honest out there. That's why out there. If you're going to write code for industry for a, for a short task to do some calculations out there, 90% of the time you're going to grab Visual Basic and do it. Even though you're not taught Visual Basic, Visual Basic is a fairly easy language to learn. And Visual Basic is used for about 80% of all programming done for desktop applications today, right there. Especially for the web out there. You know, the mindset of BEM that we should be teaching everybody C is something I won't comment on, especially since it's a recording, but that there. But most engineers, especially electrical engineers, aren't going to program in C. <laughs> I'm telling you that halfway through a course where I'm forcing you to learn C, <laughs> that you're probably not going to use C very often. However, if you learn C, learning Java, learning Python, learning MATLAB is all out there. And you'll see that MATLAB looks a lot like C when you start writing M files. They look very similar to each other. So that there. The syntax of Visual Basic is its own complete different animal right there. It's much easier to tame, much easier to learn, much easier to use, but it's completely different than any of the other languages that you see out there. But it's also the most commonly used because it is the easiest to jump in there and write a short little program to do something. Especially if you want to put a GUI in. You know, a GUI is a graphical user interface. So that there. So, all right. That there. We talked about the returns. I, I went through and I did the example where we could have two return statements in the same line. If, if X is greater than Y return X, else return Y. Right there, I did that example. Right there. Okay. Function prototype, also called a function declaration, right there, tells the compiler. Now, this is a very important thing, is these function prototypes are important, right there. And that's why you include the C math, you include math, you include string. Back in C, not C++, and C, you would put a line there, star, include... 
and you put bracket, I'll put it underneath there, bracket, right there, and I lost it, right there, include open bracket math dot h. Now you do the include and you say math, but there you don't put the dot h in there, although it's, it's assumed, and then you do using namespace standard that there, so it's a little bit different. But what's in these files is all the function declarations that are, that are contained in the math library. Something we haven't talked about, but we can write multiple files for a program. And I've worked on projects where I've had multiple files for that there, matter of fact, many projects that there, you know, one project in particular, you know, it was for an alcohol interlock system and I had a series of functions that had to call, talk to the uh, alcohol sensor. I had another series of functions that had to talk to the fingerprint reader and the, that there, I had another, another series of functions that had to interface with X with Excel in order to download the database into the Excel spreadsheet that there for reports. So I had a lot of different types of functions right there. Many, many different types of functions out there. And the entire program was probably about that thick, about an inch and a half thick of paper. I mean, it was a very large program. This was like a three-year project with, with about four engineers on it. I was that there. I was the lead engineer, lead engineer on this project. And I wrote the bulk of the main part of the code, but I had other engineers that were working on other parts that, there, that worked for me at the time. And each, each group of files, were, or each group of functions, were in their own file and tested separately. So every time somebody wrote a function, they would write a, a main routine just to test the function out there. They would pass parameters, see that they got things right there. They would. You know, they would hook it up to the, the sensor and see whether or not it read the sensor and talked to the sensor correctly. It would connect to the PC and the Excel database and, it would ex and download the data correctly. But they would test each series of functions that they're separately. And then we would bolt them all together. Well, each one of those functions were a separate file. And we would compile them separately and then we would link them together at the end. Well, in the C library, there's a library for math functions. And all that's in that library are all the math functions. You're going to find a function for cosine, a function for tan, a fun function for this, a function for that. And every function in that library needs a prototype right there. So you, if you write a function, you either have to put the function before main or before it's called in the main code, or you have to put a prototype right there. So when you do the include, you're including all those function prototypes is what you're doing. That just tells the compiler the name of the function, what the data is expected that there, the number of parameters and types, and the order right there. All it is is that first line of the function right there. And you just put a semicolon in it. You don't have to put the variable names x, y, z. You just put x, comma, x, or int, comma, int, comma, int. The x, y, z is not important right there right there. It is down below in the actual function itself, but it, in the function declaration, you only have to declare the types right there. So, but what's defined is the compiler, when it compiles, will go through and check your code, wherever you call that function, and it checks to see whether or not, when I say y is equal to cosine x, that x is a floating point number and Y is the floating point that returns back right there. So it just checks, all, all the compiler is doing, it's not checking whether it's valid data, it just checks to see whether it's the right type in the number. If I say cosine X comma Z, I should get an error because I'm passing two parameters instead of one. If I pass cosine name, and name happens to be a string, I should get an error because it's the wrong type. Or if I say name is equal to cosine x, because name is a string and this is returning back a type float right there. Now, if I pass it an integer, that's not a problem right there, because it can convert from an integer to a float easily. If it's expecting an integer and I pass it a float, I should get a warning that it's going to truncate my data 
up there. So, but regardless, all this function prototype does is just tells me whether or not the arguments that I'm passing or the parameters that I'm passing to the function agree with what I'm, you know, that there. So the compiler, okay, now here comes the sleepy heads, right? Or Jeep the big breakfast. <laughs> that there. Should pick up people coming in late. So, again, that there usually include pre processing to obtain the, for the C standard library. That there also include written by you or other programmers. Again, if the functions are the ones that you wrote, which is the case in this class, you're going to be writing, you'll be writing some functions for, for this project, I hope, right there. That if the, pro, if the functions are contained within the same file as main, you don't need to include a header file for that there. You can just put the function prototypes right in the file at the top, right there. And I went through and I gave the basic outline of what the file should look like. And we'll see again as we go through these examples up here. But if you're doing like I, you know, like the project I talked about where I had probably, all of a sudden that probably three, four hundred functions in, in this particular code. Again, this was a two year project with three or four engineers working on it and a couple of technicians. I mean, it was a big multi million dollar project right there. And it was quite large that there. You know, you know, it was just too much to handle trying to do it all in one file. You just could not do it. If we tried writing this entire code in one file without using functions, that would have been a 15 year project and never would have worked right there. It just that there. And it was, you know, it was a simple little project. It was, all it was was a device that hooked up to your car that when you got into your car, you had to put your fingerprint on the fingerprint reader and it, make sure it's you. You had to blow into the little sensor if you stopped at the pub and had two beds to drink, it won't let you start your car. Not there. So it was, and these were ordered by the court to be put in various people's cars that had been arrested for drink driving. Not there is what is what this project was. This was like 15, 20 years ago that we developed developed it. There, there's, they're actually pretty much standard issue, and you know the one that we developed is still on the market. That there. It's been modified a couple of times simply because the technology's gotten better right there. But, but again, you know, but it, it was just one of those projects, but it was so large of a project. It d doesn't look like a big project. I mean, the thing fits, it holds in your hand. And then there's just a relay, under, you know, put on the starter relay. You know, there's a relay going to the starter coil that just simply would disengage the, the starter if the thing came back and said that you had been drinking. That thing. We also have some nice little features like it would, it would start beep, beeping at the driver halfway through the drive. He'd have to pick it up and blow in it. And if he, if his blood alcohol level was above 0 0.01 or 0 0.08, that there point, point it was originally 0 0.1, and then most of the states started changing to 0 0.08. That there, if it was above 0 0.08. It start, it start flashing the lights and, and beeping the horn every now and then to get the attention of law enforcement to pull this guy over. He's dropped. <laughs> that there, we you know, we had some of these features in it. That there. Yeah, and actually, there was talk about making it mandatory for all vehicles, but the you know, civil rights people said no. But, but again, that there. So, but all I'm saying is that if you, for what you're going to be doing, you probably won't create any .h files yourself, right there. You'll probably just put the function prototypes in the same file as your main, as the functions you write. Multi-file programming is really more at the project level, and you know, out of your graduating class, one person may switch careers and end up becoming a programmer. They decide that they don't like doing power distribution or wiring specifications or something like that. And they decide they really like programming. They become a programmer instead of an engineer. Then that person might be doing some of that there. So, and I went through engineering school and I actually worked as a programmer for, for a number of years out there. So, and incidentally, there's a kind of a comment is that most of industry in the U.S. have discovered it's easier to teach an engineer how to program than it is to teach a programmer how to do engineering work. So that's why a lot of the, the, the embedded engineers or software engineers are almost came from the electronics 
engineering side and not from the programmer side. You know, you know, computer science majors almost never do hardware work because they can't think in terms of inter hardware interfacing that there. They just think in terms of writing code in the hardware side. So you find a lot more engineers that become, become programmers slash engineers versus programmers that become programmers slash engineers. That you know, it works the other way out there. Okay, out there. So if a function is defined before it's invoked, then you don't need to put the declaration line in there. I have known people, and I actually did it for a number of years, and then I quit doing it because my, co my code started getting too hard to find it. <clears throat> but there, you know, I've known engineers, and, and, and it's a pain in the neck to do it this way. But they would have your, you know, you know, here's the start of your program. You have your includes and your comments and all that stuff there. Then here's your global variable declaration. So this is your include and other stuff right there. That's your start of your code right there. And then we would do our includes. And then I would put all my functions here at the top right there. And then way down at the bottom of my functions would be main right there. There. The way I said the other day, you would take these and you move them down under main, but then you put in another section up here, right here, which would be your function prototypes. Right there. That's your function prototypes. The disadvantage, there's two disadvantages to doing it the way I used to do it. Right there. The number one disadvantage is you got to go all the way to the bottom of your code to find your main program. It's all the way at the bottom of the file. Right. The other problem is when you declare these and you don't use function headers, then you have to be very careful that if functions are calling functions, that you order those, that the function that's calling another function, that the function that's calling is above it right there. So the order of this has to be that this function doesn't call anything, this function can only call that one, this function can call this one, or this one. You know, the order of the functions that you put them in at the top makes a huge difference right there. And it's a pain in the neck when your, your program starts getting larger. Oh, I'm calling this function there, so i got to move that one above that one there. And you're always moving functions above each other in order to get it to work. And the compiler keeps barking at you if you don't get them in the right order. And once in a while you get into a situation that's like, uh, I can't get them in the, in, the, in the correct order. You just keep trying different things up there. So it's easier just to put all the function declarations at the top right there and then list the functions below right there. So that gets rid of the problem because the compiler can just look at the function prototypes and test the code underneath it. It doesn't need the function itself. So we put the main and then we put all the functions after it. And then of course main, which is the main part of your code, that there is right at the top of your code. It's the first thing you see when you're, you open the file as far as code, and then you look at at there. See, the same thing's kind of true with you know the classes, but the classes are treated as individual blocks right there. That there, so let's go back. So always provide, even though it's possible to omit that there. Again, what he's saying is to omit when functions are defined before they're used. Provide function. Well, he's trying to code the order in which functions are defined, which can easily change as the program evolves. That there. So as you can tell, his comment right there means that he did the same thing at one time. And the father is about the same age as I am, the son, Dectal and Dectal. The, the, I think I mentioned it's a father-son group that wrote, that wrote this book. But they're, the father is about the same age, maybe a little older than I am. So a lot of the things that I used to do that I see in these comments, I know that he did the same thing at one point and learned those lessons. That there, It's a very common lesson. That there, so provide avoids trying to code to code in in the order in which functions are defined, which can easily change as the functions evolve. So evidently, he had a situation where he made some modifications to the code, which meant that 
he, he had to go through and reorder his functions in order to get it to work. It worked fine. He changed the code. He called a function that's defined afterwards. All he re then he had to go back and move that function up there. So he set up the rule which says always provide function prototypes, even if you can get away with not doing it. If you code, the, if you do your code the way I said, you'll always have to do it because the, all the function prototypes are at the bottom, right? There, or all the functions are at the bottom, and all the prototypes are at the top, out there. And the biggest programming mistake that I make anymore is that I, I write a new function and I forget to add the prototype to the prototype list at the top. I decide, I, you know, I'm writing the code, I decide I want to add a new function. So I go through, I write the new function, I stick it at the bottom, and I call, and I, I put it in there, and I write my code, and I call the new function, bam, I get a syntax error. Function undefined. And then I go back and I realize I forgot to, but there. And what I always do is I write the function at the bottom and then I copy and paste the, the top line, put a semicolon, and remove the variable names out there. So it's fairly straightforward to do that there. At there. Functions in the same scope must have unique signatures out there. That's the, out there. Uh, scope of function is that there. We won't talk about, we haven't talked about scope so much. Must have unique signatures. A scope means that it's it's within, you know, functions are normally global the way that I work because I've always worked in C. C++ functions can be within a class and that class is the scope of, of, of the function right there. If it's a function written outside of a class, it's a global function right there. But we won't get into that there. Argument cohesion, that we've talked about that there. Uh, promotion occurs when the type of function doesn't match the type parameter. But they're arithmetic types. Okay, this is basically what they're saying here is that as we go down this list, it's easy to take something like char and convert to an unsigned char or char and convert to a double. But if you go down, if you got a long double and you convert that to a double, you may lose data. If you convert from a double to a float, you may lose data. If you float, convert from a float to a long, long int, right there, or a just an int, right down here, you're going to lose data. But if you go up the list, then you're not going to lose data. So that's all that I'm saying is that if you pass, for example, to cosine, which is a type double, you pass it a integer, no problem. But if you try to pass a function that is looking for an integer, a double, you're going to have a problem, which is all this is saying right there. Contemplation errors with the arguments do not match that, that there. We've mentioned that many multiple times. That there, the C Center library, that they're each with its own header file. We've talked about that. Math is one. Strength, or uh, council mani you know, manipulation where we that there is another, the string library is another. We have many, many libraries that are that are there. So it contains the definitions that there. And the header file just simply has all the prototypes. Again, here's some IO stream is one, IO manipulation, stream manipulation, math, the let's see, ju -ju -ju. Oh, this is the conversion library, the time library. There's all kinds of different libraries in there. And one of the biggest problems is knowing which libraries you have to call if you use a particular function right there. So I've known people, and it's, it's crazy, but they just wrote a file that just said include, and they listed all the possible includes, and then they always just include that. So they include every library with every, every program. They don't get any errors, it's just, it just slows the compiler down, that there. But if you include a library, and as you see, the list goes on and on and on, right there. So, that there. Stacks, unordered maps, that there. C string, that there. Type infos, exceptions, memory. Oh, uh, see, I've never used F string. String I've used, stream I've used. You can see the list of C standard I.O. Is, is actually one that you almost always include right there. So as you can see, there's a lot of different libraries out there. And that's just a partial list, actually, out there. 
So typically as you go through and you find these these function calls that you're going to use, you have to know what libraries are required. And there's entire data books. I'll find one and that there and kind of show you. It lists all of the various functions that you can call. And that there actually the textbooks got most of them in there. So, right there. Okay. Now I'm going to switch topics here. And how are we? All oh, we're in great shape on. The, oh, we're not in great shape on the projector because this is one of the ones that the. I think it's. Yeah, it's this one here. It's this cable. Get to work. Don't touch it. Not there. So, okay, a random number generator is, and I, and I mentioned this in the introduction of the chapter. There's a function called ran that generates an unsigned integer between zero and max ran, right there. And we can do some things in order to reduce that there, but it's a function just simply returns a random integer. Now, different. Compilers use different functions that they're in, and they're slightly different. Visual C, for, or I mean Visual Basic, for example, their random number generation generator returns something between 0 and 1, and it's a floating point number right there. So this one returns an integer at the But again, here, so max ran is at least 32,700 that there. For GUN and Visual Studio, that it's that th right there. This is the that happens to be the the Linux uh, C compiler right there, and what all, and it's also the uh, open source C compiler. You can get it for Windows as well, right there. But it, most people that use GNU is, are are running Linux right there. But its max RAND is you know, that huge number. Visual Studio uses 32,767. I assume that's what Dev C uses right there. So, if that there, and the RAND function is a pseudo random number generator. It's not a true random number generator. This says if it truly produces integers at random, every number between zero and RAND. Mat, er, Rand max has equal chance of probability each time it's called. Well, that's not true. I remember back when Basic first came out on the IBM PC, and I'm going back well over 30 years ago. We used to write programs where we would tell it to put a random, put a, a one, a dot on the screen wherever the you know, the random numbers were, and you would see distinctive lines. They, you know, there was there was numbers that were never called in that group that there. And then there's numbers that were called many, many times. So it's not truly random. It's pseudo-random right there. So, that there. Okay, I, I like to give this program. It may find, it find itself on the final exam, to be honest with you, that there. I think the last time I finished up this class for Suraya, I made people do a random number simulation for the C portion of the code, right there. And, we roll a dice right there, and we want a number between one and six right there. Or this is between zero and one five, and then we add a one right there. But we use the modulus operation right there. So we take ran parentheses close parentheses. This is a number between zero and thirty-two seven sixty-seven right there. It's a random number. We divide it by six and take the remainder. That's what this modulus operation is. It's the remainder after you do a divide by six. We don't care how many times it's divided by six. We just care what's left over. So that generates a random number between zero and five. And then if I add one to it, that's there. Now, one thing I should point out, it's not really part of this course, but that there. But when we look at random numbers, and let's just look at dice. Now, of course, how many people, you, you know, everyone here knows about throwing dice, right? I mean, you know what a, a dice is. It's one of those, little, it's a little cube that's got six sides on it, and little dots one, you know, between one and six right there. 
and, you know, they're played in a lot of, you use in a lot of games of chance, and of course, that's good Muslims, you've never been to a casino and played craps, right? Right there. But there's a, you know, there's a game called craps that you throw the dice, and certain things happen if you throw certain things. But if you play the old Monopoly game, anybody ever see the game of Monopoly, but a lot of board games, you'll throw, shake the dice and throw that, that there. So, when you look at throwing one dice, you, you've got a range from zero to six, right? Now, probability-wise, it's going to look like this. The probability of getting a one is one six. The probability of getting a two is one six. Three is one six. Four is one six. Five is one six. Six is one six. So the probability of getting one, two, three, da, da, six is equal to one six for each one of those. If you throw two dice, the probability, you've got a range from between zero and 12, right? But the probability of going between two and 12 it doesn't look like this. And the reason is, is that to get a two, I have to throw a one, one. So there's one chance there. To get a three, I'm going to put a two, to get a three, I can throw a one, two, or a two, one. So there's two probabilities of getting that there. So if I throw two dice, I have twice the probability of getting a three as I am getting a, a two. To get a four, I can get a one, three, a three, one, a two, two, and a two, two is just one right there, that there. So I got three possibilities right there. To get a five, I've got a possibility of one, four, four, one, three, two, two, three. And I think that's it right there, yeah. So I've got four possibilities. Uh, to get a six, I've got one, five, five, one, two, four, four, two, three, three, right? Right there. Those are, so I got five possibilities right there. So as you go through and you look at this here, you can see that I've got a one out of 12 chance of getting a two, a one out of six chance of getting a three, a three out of 12, or a one fourth chance of getting a four, a four out of 12, or a one third chance of getting a five. You know, my probabilities of getting various numbers goes up. Actually, there's that there. And you end up with something that looks more like this right there, where this is your seven is your most commonly rolled dice. Your one, your two, and your 12 are your least thrown combinations right there. So you, it's not a continuous function. So when you do random number generation, you have to keep that in mind out right there. So, so if, you, if you end up with a project where I say you need to throw, a, throw two dice out there, don't use a random number generator that's going to give you between 2 and 12. Use two random number generators that each one of them gives you between 1 and 6 and you'll get the correct probability. That there. So, in other words, you would you would write your code, you know, for one dice it would be die is equal to random percent 6 plus 1 right there. That's one dice right there. Dice, two, in other words, two dice, is equal to random percent six plus one plus random percent six plus one right there. Right there. So in other words, I have two different random, I call the random number generator twice right there. So... So it's just one of those things that you have to be aware of when you're using random number generations is that you you have a random number generator that's going to give you a random number between 0 and 32,767. You have to use that to get whatever distribution you want. Now this is not a course it's in probability theory. I don't know, is there a course that you take in probability theory? I know when I went to engineering school, we had a course in, in random numbers and probability right there. That was a required course, E302, I think it was, or 
yeah, E302, we had to take random there. And it was a very difficult course, by the way, a very difficult course. Uh, we, you know, a lot of people flunked that course. Uh, but there were probably 30% of the students had to take it twice up there. So it was up there. So we could shift the values right there. So in other words, what they say is here we're just simply going through and we're going to now this is set the width uh, right there to 10 and we're going through random number right there if it's divisible by 5 start a new line and right there and uh, okay they're just going through and just simply right there but we're going through we're looping 25 all this is doing is just generating 20 numbers between 0 and 6 right there right there because this function right here gives you a random number or excuse me This function here gives you a random number between 0 and 5. We had a 1 to it right there. So, right there. So that's all that's doing is just shifting that there. And that just shows that, that there's 6, 6. Well, we got a lot of 6s in this round here, that there. So, now one of the things we quite often do, they don't do it here, is we also quite often seed our random number generator, but we'll, we'll talk about that there. So, to show the numbers produced by random curve or the approximately equal, simulate 6 million right there in each range between 0 and 1, 6 should show up a million times right there. Oh, right here. So, this is a function that counts how many times the number shows up right there. We've got six variables between 1 and 6 that we initialize to 0. We call, and this is actually written almost in standard C, right there, because it's not bothering right there. We go through here and we run the function six billion times. We we'll go through a loop and we're going to run this function six billion times, right there. And so, you know, and of course I challenge somebody to sit there and throw the dice six billion times to keep track of each and every throw. That they're on a piece of paper, write down a one for every time you get a particular value, right there. So this is going to go through here, and it's going to generate a random number right there. It does a switch, and it just increments whichever one between 0 and or between 1 and 6. It just increments up there. And then at the end, we're just going to show that we're going up there, that we have roughly a million rolls per each 1 through 6. So this is just a way of testing the random number generation, right there. And the only thing that you need to be worried about for the final project, it's not on the midterm project, but is that you will get a random number generator problem, most likely on the final project, right there. So you'll have to come back and look at it there. I think the last time I played the game of uh, flags, I think, I don't know if it was flags, but whatever, but you know, there's there's what, 14 states in Malaysia, right? Right there. So I think that's right. It's 13 plus uh, Lapan, is that is that correct? Okay. So yeah, so I played the game that you know you walk up to a little vending machine and you drop in, you know, 20, 20 cent and you get a flag in, in a little plastic container right there. And how many 20 cent pieces are you going to spend to get all 14 flags right there. And the assumption we made is that there was an infinite number of flags in the machine, so you had a, an equal probability of getting any one of those flags each time you put in a 20 cent piece right there. It's the same program I used to play in the States where we used to have little football helmets that there, you know, the NFL used to have 28 teams that there, used to have 24 teams and then went to 28, I don't know what it is now, it might be 32 teams up there. But each team's got a football helmet. Every time I went to McDonald's, I got a little helmet with my Happy Meal right there. So how many Happy Meals do I have to buy in order to get all 28 helmets right there? And the assumption was is that we had an equal number of Happy Meal, or of helmets for every up there. 
So I'm originally from Minnesota, so if I went to McDonald's and I bought a Happy Meal, and there's 28 teams, that on average, every 28 trips, I should get a Minnesota Vikings helmet right there. So there's an equal number of helmets in the pool right there. So how many trips to McDonald's did I have to make to, to get all 28 helmets up there? And I guarantee you it's not 28. It's a number much greater than 28. Because just as you know, every time I, you, know, you buy a particular helmet or, or get a particular flag or whatever, the probability of getting that same flag a second time doesn't go down because you already have one in your collection. So once you have slang or up there, you go back and you buy another flag, you may get slang or again. You got a one out of 14 chance of getting slang or a second time. You, you got three slang or flags sitting on your shelf, and you go buy another flag, you still got a one in 14 possibility of getting another slang or flag. So you may have four sitting on your, your, your shelf up there. So it's one of the, of course your odds go get better if you like five of you go together and you exchange flags but you know part of the game was I didn't allow that <laughs> so again that's the type of thing on, on the random number generation right there random number generation also comes into play a lot for example if you're predis pre predicting electricity usage that there the usage of electricity by a particular household is not a random event but it can be treated as a random event but there, so many homes in a particular subdivision are going to run air conditioners on, on certain days, right there, and that's a quasi-random. It's not going to be a uniform random event. It may be a normal distribution, be by normal distribution. So, in a more advanced course, you would have to learn how to generate distribution patterns with up there. I will treat the, the the worst I will give is a pair of dice, where you have to do two dice up there. But if you were taking a course of random variables, then you would have to look at how would you create a normal distribution. A normal distribution is this one right here, right there. Now the average grade is supposed to be a C, for example, right there. And I'm supposed to have so many A's and so many F's type thing. Right there. That's a normal distribution. Right there. I haven't seen a normal distribution grade curve in 20 years. Grade inflation makes it look more like this. Right there, with this is the B is the average grade, and there's quite a bit of A's, very few C's, and even less D's right there. You know, when I first started teaching, we used to give a fair number of D's, and D's became as departments changed their criteria, and they said that D's weren't counted toward that D's became the equivalent of F, so we quit giving D's right there. And I'm old school. You know, most academic regulations say that a D is the lowest passing grade, so if D's a, a D is a passing grade, it's just not a very good passing grade out there. I don't know what the Malaysian belief is, but I don't see very many D's given out here, so I have to assume that most people treat D's as not quite an F, but essentially the same thing, right? You know, if you get a D in a course, you usually you hide your head in shame. Is that still true out there? You know, you don't like D's out there. Okay. So, the fall to catch errors, even if you're, this is a good, this is a good tip right there. Providing the fall case and a switch to catch errors, even if you're absolutely positively 100% sure you will bet your grandmother's life on it that there's no errors in your program. As soon as you do that, there will be some glitch in the hardware that's going to cause some memory bit to change and there'll be an error out there. Not all errors and program bugs occur because your code is bad. Sometimes errors occur because the compiler is defective. Sometimes errors occur because the hardware goes bad out there. The term computer bug, does anybody know where the term computer bug comes from? You never heard the story? That there? The earliest computers were made of mechanical relays and vacuum tubes. Right there. And a mechanical relay a mechanical relay is a 
thing that looks like this and I have a magnet here and then I have two plates right there you know the conductor here I can run current through here and then this here switches a larger current and when I run current through here this is a relay that closes that switch so as you run current through here you close the switch right there and the earliest computers use mechanical relays instead of transistor switches right there right there well the earliest computer bug was insects would get into these relays and cause them not to close that there so when we talk about computer bugs the very first computer bugs in the earliest computers were literal bugs insects that would get into the computer apparatus you gotta remember computers the size of this room right there it was huge and there would be you know, 50,000 relays in here right there and you would have to go through and find, and swap out relays so you found the ones that had the, 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 the insects in them right there so the term computer bugs actually comes from the literal term insects that would get into the computer now I drive a little Best Buy some of you probably see me in a little on my little blue toy bike right there and I had problems with the starter you know, I'd go to start, it would start, I, the Vespa dealer came out, picked it up at the house, and took it apart, and found that ants had got into my starter relay. And it was the same thing as these original, but I had ants that had nested inside the starter relay that was causing my bike not to start. And the solution to that was to quit parking over at this end under the trees there where the, you, you see toward the hostels, that little parking lot there at the end of this building. That happens to be underneath a bunch of trees there and there's a whole bunch of ants underneath that there. So when you park there, Vespas don't have very good uh, seals on their, on their starters. You know, the starter really, it's underneath the foot panel right there. And because the seals don't keep these very small ants out, the ants get into this get into the uh, area between you know under your foot foot rest there and causes the server relay to not function so now I park my bike over here where there are no ants and I don't ha I haven't had that problem but there's another guy that works for uh, BMI he also rides a red Vespa so there's two Vespa riders here and he had the same problem parking down there so two Vespa owners parked their bikes in the same spot Got had ants get into our server relays right there. So again, this term bug simply doesn't always mean that your program is bad out there. It may very well mean that the users put in bad data. It may mean that the hardware is malfunctioned. There may be a the motherboard may have a little spot on you know a little place you know if a particular memory address is address it causes it to read the wrong address. You know, it could be a hardware problem. The compiler may compile your code incorrectly, right there. All kinds of things happen. The processor itself might have a bug in it. There was a deal about, oh, this is probably about the time most of you were born, 20 years ago, with the uh, Intel uh, Pentium 4 came out. I believe it was the Pentium 4, it had a bug. And there was a certain program that you could run and it would tell you whether or not that particular Pentium chip, if it had the bug, a certain production range. And, and you know, the engineers found out how to detect whether or not it's a bad chip or a good chip. And you could determine where the bug is. The bug might only show up in, in your running your code once every three years on average. But what it did show up, it could cause some serious problems out there. So they had to get them all off the market. <laughs> so you know they, you know, Intel sent this program out. They posted it on the websites that there every computer gig, and everybody that owned a Pentium four was supposed to run this program. If it came back that you had the bug, you're supposed to take it to a shop and they would replace your microprocessor. Not there. So it was one of those cases. And Intel, of course, had a lot of egg on its face. I mean, they were very embarrassed about that. Thing. But this, this is the case where the the processor itself had an error. So what the author is telling us there is always when you do a switch state statement, always put in a, a default right there, right there. 
So right here, here, it says default. I'll put C out. Program should never get here. <laughs> right there. So if he's running his code and he sees that running right here. Now remember, this particular switch statement is being run six million times in this particular piece of code. Because this loop right here is one to six million right there. So we're generating a random number. The value is base right there. That's a random number. And we look for a value between one and six. And we increment the frequency for that particular number. If it's not between one and six, something went wrong, right? Right there. So that's why, so if, so if you run this code and you get this message, program should never get here, there's a problem right there. What the problem is, no clue. But we know that there's something wrong. And if it's this code here, and we know the code is good, we know it's probably a hardware problem with the computer or the compiler. Something's going wrong. So again, this just outputs it right there. Okay, pseudo random that there, again, produces that appears to be random. It's not ex purely random right there. Now normally we have a function called sran that initializes the random number generator so we don't get the same sequence of numbers every time right there. So that, that's what that particular does that there. So get there. So we're seeding the random number right there and we just give it a seed right there. Normally you have the person just type in any number, they make a number and we randomize their number generator right there. Right there, randomizing it. Typically, we would use it with time. Right there, time just reads the number of seconds since January first, nineteen seventy. This is on a Windows machine. Right there, and time. And all this does is just randomize our number generation with a different seed every time. Right there. So, so a random number generation is a program that goes through a bunch of iterations to generate a number that looks random right there. But you have to seed it with a particular number. Now if you give it the same seed every time, you're going to get the same sequence of random number gen numbers every time. That's very useful if you want to repeat. You want, you're, 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 for testing purposes, you want to make sure you get the same sequence of numbers so that you can go through and verify what's going on. But normally, if you're doing random number generation, you want a different sequence right there. It wouldn't be very fun if you had a lottery and that there, if you ended up with the same number every week, right? I mean, the Chinese, uh, you know, what do they call? What do they? The states we have them called the lottery that the states run, where you you buy it, you pick six numbers, and if the, you get the six numbers all get hit, you win a bunch of money, and if you don't, they don't don't get hit, you. Don't get hit, you lose all your money, type thing up there. You know, they, they call it the lottery. And I know uh, total or something like that, the Chinese tend to run a number of little shops around here, right there. So, you know, we, we, in the States, we refer to this retirement plan for idiots that there is people that think that they're going to get the retirement from, from the lottery because your chances of winning the lottery aren't very good up there. So, but. Uh, so, but some people tend to think we got good chances. I see a lot of people buying these total tickets. Right that there. Is, is that the right term, total? That's what they call that there. But you, you see people standing out there buying the tickets, and you see a lot of them on the ground, but they don't win type thing that there. You know, they, they rarely win, right? That there. So, and keep in mind that th those places are in business because they make money. And, the, and you know, I, one of the things I t tell people, and I, and I never was a gambler that there. So, you know, nothing about religion or anything else. I never gambled that there, other than when I was very young and stupid <laughs> that there. And all it takes is one trip to Las Vegas. And I know that none of you probably have been to Las Vegas, but some of you might have seen Genting Highlands, right? Out there. And you've seen the big casino there. And, 
you see all the bright lights, the fancy food, the cheap buffets, the free drinks. Las Vegas, they, they serve free alcohol, too, not there. So, well, and again, there's a reason for free alcohol out there. And that there. But none of that is paid for by people that want a bunch of money and donated to the casino to make it nice for the next person. All that is paid for by the money that people have lost in the casino. So far more people lose money than ever make money. So that should tell you without knowing anything about probability or random numbers that if you gamble, the odds are you're going to be losing money right there. That's, see, in the states, for example, will use the lotteries that are run by the state governments in order to fund schools and, and scholarship programs out there. Well, if these lotteries paid out more money than they collected, in other words, the odds were you're going to win something, then there would be no money to put into the state treasury that there. So a lot of people despise lotteries, myself as one, because it's considered a tax on the poor because only people that are too stupid to do math buy lottery tickets in great quantity out there. And there are a lot of people like that in the U.S. You know, you stop to buy petrol and you can't get up there to pay for your gas because you got five people trying to buy lottery tickets. They're sold a lot at, at the... Uh, equivalent of uh, Patronus, you know, where you, you know, the little convenience store, they sell lottery tickets at the counter at the, at these, at the petrol stations up there. And you can't get petrol, pay for your petrol because too many people are buying lottery tickets on, especially when it's up there. So, but regardless, I sidetracked that discussion that there, but, you know, these random number generators are used now, most states actually use the balls with the little out there, but again, we have this fuck this that there. You only call that once at the beginning of your program. Just randomize your random number generator, and that there, it's just a necessary statement. Don't need to know how it works, but if you're going to use random number generators, that there, you need to include the time prototype <laughs> right there, and you need to do, include the S RAND function call, and then you can call RAND. Don't call RAND without calling this first. But you only call it once, right there, right there. So I'll produce again. That's the same, right there. Shifting value plus the 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 range, right there. I've already talked about that. There. This is the game of craps, right there. I'm not going to go through the game of craps. I used to assign this actually to my students as one of their assignments, that right there, and they were required to play. You know, 500,000 games of craps and see what the probabilities of winning was right there. So, right there. But again, now, this is something new. Pay attention to this right here because I, I will come back to that there. This is the first time this is introduced in these slides right there. This is a statement right here where I'm declaring a variable of type enumerated. Enumerated is a variable that can only take on certain values, right there, and I declare it. So I have a variable now called status, that's the name of the variable, and it can either be continue, one, or loss. So I can have an enumerated value, and I can call it days of week, right there right there, and it can have the value of Sunday. Well, I'm just going to put sun, put uh, put Sunday, Monday, and end with Saturday right there. And I can list the seven days of the week right there. So, you saw, I could say if then I can declare a variable days of the week right there, and then I declare a function, a, this is the name of the variable game status right here. I'm declaring the variable here, right here. So I would declare, and let me just do this on a separate page right here, right there. I declare a type. And my pen is, and I'm actually 
your next class is at 10, right? 10, 15? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be wrapping up here before too long, right here, but I want to cover this enumerated first. Right there. We didn't start till 8.15 anyway, so. So, so we're going to declare a type enumerated right there. And we're going to call it days. Right there. And I'm going to, and I'm going to call Sunday, Monday. And normally you would put these all in capitals, but I'm going to there. And dot, 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 dot. And then we close that with Saturday is your last day. So we list that there. I could have another one enumerated months right there where I would list that January all the way down to December right there right there now this declares a type that's a type definition right there right there it's not I have not declared a variable that's like declaring a class now if I want to use that I have to declare a variable so I could I could say days Days is now just like it, float, char, string, or anything like that. And then I say working. Or let's just make it simple here. Two days date. Right there. So this is a variable decoration right there. So I can say today's date is equal to Sunday, right there, right there. I can't say today's date is equal to January because January is out of my list of dates, right there. But I can at there. That's a variable, right there. It's an enumerated type, and it's very commonly used to to de you know, to define various things right here. So in this particular case, we have the game of the, the game of crafts, without going into that there, and I don't want to get accused of teaching you how to play casino games that there, that's that's probably not a good thing to be, be accused of doing, but since so the slides talk about this game of crafts, and it's one I've used in the past, the way the game is played is I throw the two dice, and if it's a 2 or a 12, I win, and I, and, and, and I, and, and I get the prize. If it's a 7 or... Or I can't remember that there. It's been, again, okay, the faces have one that there, some that there, seven or okay, if it's seven or eleven, you win on the first throw. If it's two, three, or twelve, it's called craps. You loses. The house wins. If it's four, five, six, or seven, eight, anything else it becomes your point, and you keep rolling until you either get your point to win or your seven to lose. And as we mentioned before, seven is the most common number that you're going to get. So. That there, two and twelve are the least common, but as it turns out, this particular game, if you play it a million times, you got about a forty-eight percent percent chance of winning each game. That there, and you know, and that was what the assignment was: is that you know, I had people play this a million times, five million times, and how many? What's your percentage of winning? And you never come up with more than fifty percent. You come close to fifty percent. But you got to remember the way casinos work, is they want to make you feel like you can win, right there. So, so the whole idea is if you're winning just less than half the time, you're actually losing. There's a rule in, in probability called the law of large numbers. The more often you play a game of chance, the more likely your final winnings are going to equate to the actual probability of winning the game. So if you play a game like craps, where you got a 48% chance of winning and a 52% chance, chance of losing, you play it long enough, you lose all your money. You play it for an hour, you might be ahead, you might win some money. You play it for two hours, you might be even. You play it for three hours, you're probably going to be down. The longer you play the game and the more often you play the game, the more likely you are that you're going to lose your money right there. And over a lifetime, you almost always lose that there. So, that there. I mean, and there's a reason, like I said, casinos have give away free alcohol and things like that. And by the way, the, the free alcohol, the reason they give free alcohol away is that people's brains don't function well when they're drinking alcohol. And they tend to, 
gamble more money than they can afford to give away. Right there. So they, they like their gamblers to be slightly intoxicated because they're not thinking clearly. That there. So it's you know, it only takes like an hour or two in a casino with free alcohol to see the guy who's been drinking too heavily and has just spent the next month's mortgage payment at the casino and his wife's probably going to divorce him because they can't, won't have a place to live out there. And believe me, I've seen that happen multiple times in, in, in cities that have casinos out there. So, but again, the whole idea of this game here right there is that we have the game status, which is either continue, which means that we, we've got a point, we've either won the game or we've lost the game, right there. So we've got three possibilities that we can be in, right there. So, and we have all kinds of that, that there. So, enumerated types are, and the only thing I want to get across here is, the, is how we declare enumerated type. These here are now keywords within your code. That's why they're usually all capitalized. I did capitalize mine on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or, or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that there. So the variable game status now is a variable of type status, and it can only take on the value of continue, win, or loss, right there. It only has one of those up there. So what is the weather forecast today? Hot, humid, hot, humid with rain, that they're, you know, we only have, they probably have 10 different weather forecasts, so they just fill in one of those blanks right there. Right there. For KL, it's the same weather forecast every day, right? Low of, uh, the low is what, 26, the high is 33, with a chance of thunderstorm. That's the only forecast I've ever seen since I've lived here, out there. So the rest of this right here is is uh, how the game is played. Sum of dice, right there, right here. Sum of dice is equal, you throw the dice again. And notice that we write a function here to throw the dice, right there. And also note that we're, he's back to doing this my way without do, fooling around with the, with the, uh, with the uh, glasses. He's just sitting, simply writing C++ code straight, right there, but I see. Here's his function for roll dice, right there. Again, he does it as two dice rolls, as I mentioned before. He actually calls it dice one and dice two, right there. Also notice that we have our variable decoration here. This is that top section I talked about that there that includes all your includes and your, that there are any comments. We don't have any global variables in here, so we don't have that there. Here's our function declaration right there. We only have one. Here's main. And there's our main code, and here's our roll dice right there, our function. So this particular code actually just plays one game. And what it's showing is that the, the, the player rolled a 2 plus a 5, so he won the first round. The second one, he shows that he lost right there. And, of course, here we got a 4. We keep rolling until we get a seven, he lost right there. Here he got a six, we keep rolling, he got a six before he got a seven, so he wins. But that just basically shows how the one game is played. The way that I always assign this though is, I didn't play one game at a time, I made him do it one game at a time to make sure it worked, and then I had him write, put in a function called play game that would re re return back winner or loss, and keep track of the number of wins and the number of losses, and that there, and the whole idea was to show that you almost always ended up with about 48%. Which means that if you played a million times and you bet one ringgit on each, each time you played, you would, out of your million ringgits, they would keep 520,000 of it and give you 48,000 back. That there. So you would end up short. You'd end up about four thousand rankings short out of a million rankings no forty thousand you know it's four percent so it'd be four rankings out of every hundred so that there but you'd always out of a hundred games you'd always lose two more than you won there was a spread of four so you would see how much money you would end up winning at the end of playing a million you know playing a million rankings 
you would not have a million ringgits at the end. You would have about ninety, about ninety-two thousand nine hundred ninety nine hundred nine hundred and twenty thousand ringgits. You'd lose about uh, no, yeah, about four four percent, about nine hundred eighty thousand ringgits. You'd lose nine, there. I can't do math. My math is my math gene just broke. Up there, ever have that happen? That's a good time to quit, right there. So again, enumeration study enum up there. This just goes through the enumerated. Here's my example of days of the months, right there. And notice that he said January is equal to one. You don't have to do that. It'll start if you don't do that. It'll start it with zero, though. Up there. So again, you can use integers if you want, right there. Up there, and I think uh, there you go through the, right there. and you just go through that. Okay, so random number, and I think I'm just going to stop it at this point right here. Up there. Let me, we're about, I'm thinking most of the rest of this chapter I could skip over out there. Yeah, we're, we'll be meeting next week, so out there. I'll, I'll be wrapping things up next week, hopefully. Out there, so, all right, I am going to, this actually, considering I started 15 minutes.